everyone. I'm Michael Paulchamo. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Scott Langenecker as our grand round speaker this morning. Uh, Scott is a clinical neuropsychologist and a cognitive neuroscientist. He's currently a professor of psychiatry at the University of Utah. Uh, Scott completed his bachelor's degree in psychology and history at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and then went on to do a PhD in clinical psychology at Marquette University. He did his internship at Long Island Jewish Medical Center and a postdoctoral fellowship in neuropsychology at the University of Michigan, where he then went on to become an assistant professor in the neuropsychology division of the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, Scott has therefore spent a lot of time living in states that are at the front of a lot of people's minds right now, both uh, Wisconsin and Michigan. Uh, and in 2012, Scott became the Director of Cognitive Neuroscience and Associate Professor in Psychiatry at the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, before then moving to the University of Utah to become a full professor in psychiatry in 2018. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with Scott almost 15 years ago now uh, when I was an undergraduate at Michigan. He served as my honors thesis advisor for my bachelor's degree. Uh, and I worked with Scott on studies of depression, bipolar disorder, Cushing's disease. Uh, and it was from him that I first learned some of the fundamentals of fMRI research, uh, which is something that I'm personally quite grateful for uh, to this day. And Dr. Langenecker's research focuses on mood and anxiety disorders, uh, including uh, across the lifespan and, and uses tools, including neuroimaging and cognitive tasks to better understand how to identify and treat these patients. So I hope that you will all uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Langenecker and thanking him for presenting his grand rounds uh, on a day with such high emotional valence. And uh, so welcome and, and thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Paul. Uh, I get to uh, do a little bit of em embarrassing Michael Paul first uh, before I begin. Um, so uh, Michael Paul, uh, those, those of you who may or may not know this, was referred to as the golden boy uh, when, when he was in our lab um, because everything he touched uh, turn, turned out really, really well. Uh, and I suspect that you've come to appreciate that his um, uh, intellect and interpersonal uh, skills are, are, are excellent uh, and you're really lucky to have them. So uh, I want to thank you uh, for inviting me and giving uh, me an opportunity to talk about uh, something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. And so, of course, I have to make a funny pun about it, uh, which is contemplating rumination. And it's actually uh, incredibly complex and incredibly fun. And I'm interested in understanding the, the neurocircuitry of rumination as a process. Um, uh, my co colleague refers to it as a, as a mental habit uh, in, the, in the hopes that we can actually get a handle on some of the neural signatures uh, of it and then to uh, modulate it uh, with any, any tool at our disposal. Scott, may I interrupt you for just a quick second? I think with your screen, there's something a little um, funny going on. It's kind of cut off on the right-hand side. Uh-oh. Um, um, and you're in, um, you're not in presenter view. Okay. Let me, let me actually just turn off. I'm just going to go to one. I got a dual screen. So that's probably what's, oh. what's happening here. Let me just go to one screen yeah. and that should fix the problem. Is that better? That's better. And you're still not, you're still, uh, not in the slideshow present your, uh, presenting mode. Um, oh, okay. So I think I have to do, do let's see if I can do this. Is that better? Uh, no, you're still in the uh, <laughs> editing mode, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, shoot, I've not had this problem. Screen, the, uh, there's that presentation button. Yeah, maybe that one. Try that. Is that better? Uh, it has no change. Uh, try under, view. Look under try, try um, on, on the menu uh, bar under view and see if you can put it into full screen or uh, presenter mode. Yeah, I don't know why it's giving me, I don't know why it's giving me so much trouble here. Um, yeah, stopping sharing on Zoom and starting it again may, may help. Uh, let's see if we try that. 
and then I get to figure out how I get out of this. Huh, I've never had this problem before. No worries, it's the new normal. <laughs> okay, we're gonna try that, hold on one second. Any there better? Yeah, you're good. Okay, good. All right. Uh, so let's let's go. So here are some um, uh, some some things to get your get your brain uh, humming about what is uh, what is rumination. Um, I've been giving talks on depression for nearly 20 years now, and giving talks on depression is really hard to find things that are are funny because uh, depression isn't funny at all. Um, but rumination actually just about everybody ruminates. Uh, and so we can actually poke a little fun at it. Um, and the one on the bottom left uh, of Charlie Brown probably reflects a number, a number of folks uh, in the last 24 hours. Um, and so I hope to educate you a little bit about uh, rumination and maybe have a little bit of fun with it. Um, so I always um, give, give thanks uh, at the beginning of my talks. Uh, mostly because I tend to run long, uh, but also to put front and center that I am a uh, spokesperson uh, for the work of lots of other folks. Um, and and uh, you may notice um, in the middle part there, um, uh, Mindy Schreiner, Westland Schreiner is a postdoc working with us now, who many of you uh, know quite well. Uh, so this is sources of support. Much of what I'm gonna talk about today is from um, work at UIC. I'm gonna hint at some work that we started at, at Utah in this R61. Um, and then the relevant disclosures, uh, obviously the University of Utah uh, puts a, a roof over my head, uh, so long as I continue to bring in money. Uh, I've done some uh, consulting for Otsuka on an experimental treatment for depression, uh, some work on uh, with EpiQ on a treatment resistant depression guide, uh, and secondary triad is actually um, a C Corp that my wife uh, started, who I have a, a very small um, part in, but of course, She's my wife, so I have a lot, large part in that. Um, I have some stock and mutual funds, but I do not direct them, so I have no idea what conflicts may emerge from that. Uh, research support from NIMH and NIDA, uh, NARSAD, and the Utah State Board of Education, uh, honorary from Ohio State, Emory, and of course, uh, from, from you. Um, here are my other conflicts. Uh, these are the, the folks that generate uh, joy in my life. And uh, you can see that this was, uh, the bottom right is a picture from uh, Maroon Bells in Colorado, which was actually, uh, I think one of the many places that was our, our gateway drug to the West uh, and led us to coming uh, to Utah. Uh, the, the beauty of, of the West, uh, Mountain West is, is just incredible. If you've not had a opportunity to enjoy it, uh, I re highly recommend it. Okay. So uh, I want to begin with a little bit of a preamble as to why I've moved. Uh, I sort of refer to myself as the Benjamin Button of depression research. I started out with older adults, then I went to adults, then I went to young adults, and now I'm working primarily with adolescents. Um, and uh, the, main, the main reason uh, when we were talking about this in um, uh, Katie and Bonnie's group earlier and actually chatting about it with uh, Sophia a, a little bit ago is that we've come to appreciate that there is a developmental pathway that may be um, deviating uh, during the emergence of uh, some of these um, psychiatric illnesses. And if we can intervene early, we can actually probably change the trajectory. And, and that's uh, potentially, uh, it has a potential for tremendous um, primary and secondary uh, prevention. So if, if folks are not missing out on educational, interpersonal and occupational opportunities because of depressive episodes, 
then they've got a greater opportunity and possibility of moving more towards um, neurotypical uh, milestones and, and development. At least that's the current thinking. So this is a complex graph. I want to sort of walk you through it. Uh, this is sort of my uh, movement uh, to um, neuro neurodevelopment. So I started out here at the end sort of thinking about chronic recurrent uh, depression and how that was sort of maybe a double, a double burden of age um, and the scar of illness. And the scar is more of a a figurative or um, figurative comment rather than a literal one, but there is some there's some neuroscience behind this too, right? So we're coming to appreciate that HPA axis and inflammatory changes that occur during uh, and maybe even preceding uh, episodes may um, change the plasticity uh, of of our brains and the way that we can actually learn and develop. So scar is um, a, a metaphor here, but it actually may may reflect some of the changes that happen. Um, with recurrence uh, of illness. And I've sort of walked my, walked my way back uh, thinking things just get more complicated as you move on in disease because you have uh, the secondary impacts uh, of the illness, which I just refer, alluded to before. So you might um, have educational um, barriers like dropping out of college or high school, um, missing uh, educational opportunities. You might have occupational barriers such as short or long-term disability. You might have interpersonal uh, barriers that change um, and those may uh, you know, relate to relationships, you know, divorces, um, famil familial strife and so on. So I've kind of gradually worked back further and further into this um, niche of sort of late adolescent uh, and early adulthood. And it's sort of a critical transition point um, and many of our systems are designed to help kids who have, you know, ADHD or learning disabilities effectively make transitions across their educational uh, and uh, life, um, uh, life milestones. But we don't actually have a really good way of doing that for mood disorders. Uh, and in fact, the default uh, for mood disorders is once you get better, um, there's sort of three things that happen. Um, the adolescent goes back to, to being invincible because uh, that's part of being an adolescent. Um, the parents go to a mode of, of hope and prayer um, that it doesn't come back. Um, and the educational system pretends that it didn't even happen. And we're thinking about um, neurodevelopment, eating neurodevelopment of folks with mood disorders in a way that we treat them the exact same way uh, that we work with um, uh, ADHD or learning disabilities. We think about ways to accommodate, we think about ways to remediate, and we try and get them as close to a path of neurotypical development as we can. So this little window here uh, up on top uh, illustrates sort of where we are uh, now in our work, thinking that you can do pre-illness uh, pre risk studies and you might be able to detect um, effect size differences between groups, uh, and, and you do. Um, the example here is executive functioning, and if you look at the literature, you'll see that uh, as a potential risk factor for mood disorder. Uh, then there's uh, the blue line, which is the occurrence of symptoms, and we've actually put the cognitive uh, symptoms on here potentially occurring after the symptoms. Um, I don't actually think that's true. I think there's a cognitive prodrome before symptoms. And I think there's a cognitive, for lack of a better word, hangover after symptoms resolve. Um, there's plenty of literature suggesting that prior to uh, a depressive episode, you might have decreased cognitive flexibility and that after a depressive episode, uh, you might have lingering uh, challenges uh, with sustained attention and cognitive flexibility. Long-winded way of saying that we think this is a critical point of understanding and intervening in mood disorders. So why, uh, why study youth onset depression? Uh, this is uh, slides that I uh, took from a graduate student, uh, Katie Bessett, that's working with me. And this is just some things that you all probably already know so I'm preaching to the to the crowd here. The the most um, insidious parts of this is that um, suicide attempts uh, can can happen, and anytime there's an attempt, we have an opportunity to have a loss, which is tragic. Um, there are, as I alluded to before, educational, interpersonal, and economic um, 
uh, outcomes uh, of, of mood disorder and recurrence is exceptionally high. So we wanna intervene early and change that trajectory if we can. This is um, a, a study um, sort of reporting effect sizes for different treatments. Uh, and it shows that uh, if you think about treatments for depression, um, they're actually small effect sizes uh, for, for changes, a little bit smaller than ADHD um, and less so uh, than anxiety. And uh, this is uh, another study. If you look at the, the TAD study, you'll see something similar is that uh, use of um, behavioral modification techniques, in this case, CBT is more effective than just medication alone in uh, reducing the probability uh, of relapse. Uh, here, the lines look pretty, pretty stark, but we also have some data and others do as well, showing that um, a behavioral modification therapy like CBT is gonna have a longer bang for your buck than just medication alone. Uh, this is uh, a study that I was fortunate to be a part of a couple years back, follow up from the TAD study, and it's a little bit um, daunting. So if you look at the red and the green and the blue lines, those are um, the functional outcomes for folks who got treatment at the very beginning of uh, the TAD study. So their global functioning actually improved uh, over time with treatment out to two years. The folks that got put into a placebo wait list who eventually got the exact same treatments from the exact same clinicians actually um, show a decline in functioning over time. And this kind of harkens back to the point I was making before about um, sooner is better uh, if we're talking about intervention. Okay, so what am I gonna talk about today? Uh, I wanna show you a lifespan model of recurrent MDD, sort of give you a little bit of a hint of that a moment ago. Uh, talk about some adolescent studies, uh, not a ton. Um, talk about developmental models of internalizing disorders. Uh, I have on here childhood adversity and inhibitory control regulation, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, but I am going to talk about um, the treatment modeling and prediction, and then the neural basis of rumination as a treatment target, and then rumination-focused CBT and disease treatment management. So sorry, I gave you a longer a longer talk outline that I'm going to cover today. Um, so this is uh, the initial um, uh, the initial version of the of the model that I was just showing you before, and this is based upon uh, Ken Kendler's work, which basically shows that in in childhood and adolescence, um, depressive episodes are uh, less severe and are of shorter duration, uh, and that as you move into uh, adulthood. Uh, they tend to be more severe uh, and longer. The other thing uh, that comes from this literature is that life events tend to, to be, are more likely to be triggers uh, of depressive episodes in childhood and adolescence, and that as we move into adulthood, there's some episodes that don't seem to have a clear um, onset or trigger. The red bars, however, uh, are in here to sort of show that you can have a childhood uh, life event that has a pervasive impact upon you um, as a person, sort of the psyche of you, of you as a person and your worldview, but also upon uh, your brain development that could pervade uh, throughout your life. Um, and then some uh, of these uh, life events may have shorter, um, have shorter durations in terms of their impact. The reason why this is important is that it's actually a little bit false to say that uh, episodes in, in adulthood don't have a trigger. They just may be um, a trigger from longer ago or accumulation of triggers, and it may not be um, a clear link between the um, triggers themselves and the onset of the episode. However, um, we can do things, uh, and we can do things that can help. So we can uh, provide supports. Uh, we can provide um, uh, compatible or effective milieu or environment, and we can provide treatments. And some of those treatments, just like the life events, can have a pervasive positive effect upon an individual. The most powerful example that I can think of um, in psychiatry is that if you teach somebody um, deep breathing techniques and progressive muscle relaxation who has uh, panic attacks, they will never experience a panic attack the same for the rest of their life because they have those 
basic skills at their disposal to try and modulate their physiology. That doesn't mean it's always effective. It just means that they actually have that, have that capability. And then of course, beyond, beyond the, the range of, of, of my studies, we do know that there are genes that are, that are relevant. We know that some of these genes actually have um, specific age dependent um, onset triggers. Uh, so there's a, you know, a window during um, neurodevelopment and early development. There's a hormonal window. Um, there's a, a child rearing uh, window and then sort of a nervous system degeneration window. And all of those things uh, can, can actually work uh, in complex and very difficult to understand ways, uh, which I'm not gonna talk about today. Uh, I wanna come back to this sort of classic study uh, by Caspi et al, not to say anything about uh, the HPA axis per se, but just to show in the bottom right hand um, corner here, that number of stressful life events um, has a direct and strong relationship uh, to depressive uh, symptoms, even in uh, folks uh, that, that are you know, informants or observers. Uh, so coming back to this model, um, it, it ends up being very complex. And so when you study individuals is every bit as important as what you study. So this is just another way of looking at, at the model uh, back to our original uh, graphic here. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about a, a prior study we did. Uh, this is a um, sort of mega analysis of data from multiple investigators uh, at UIC. And we were just looking at a resting state connectivity across sort of a developmental window. Um, Kitty Burkhouse did this work. She's now an assistant professor at UIC, fabulous scientist, great collaborator. Uh, we had to um, harmonize uh, the depressive and anxiety symptoms because they weren't all from uh, the same scale. Um, and then we used sort of a, a classic sort of three network uh, canonical model. So the three network canonical model is that there's a, a cognitive control or executive control uh, network, which is in yellow, uh, primarily um, prefrontal and, and uh, parietal with a, a bit of, of medial uh, prefrontal. There's a default mode network, which is predominantly uh, medial and posterior uh, cingulate but there's a, a huge representation in the temporal lobe as well. And you'll notice that there's some in the, in the ventral prefrontal cortex here as well. And then a salience and emotion network, uh, which is a little bit controversial because it combines sort of salience and um, limbic networks together. The reason why we do that uh, is because in depression, um, both um, positive and negative valence uh, systems can be disrupted and the uh, interaction or relationship between them can be disrupted. And the literature is actually incredibly complex uh, to figure out what actually is, is relevant. So we sort of lump them together. And that's why we use um, salience because positive and negative emotional stimuli are still very salient. Uh, so what we did is we used hub regions from each of those three networks to look at neurotypical development uh, in the entire brain. And the simple uh, healthy comparison results are here. Uh, so you can look at them. So in green, uh, you can see that the network increases uh, connectivity with age uh, in lateral and medial prefrontal areas and also in subcortical areas uh, and a little bit of uh, parietal cortex as, as well. So the, the network is sort of maybe expanding um, and becoming more coherent. Um, there's also an increase um, in blue of the default mode network with dorsal anterior cingulate here and lateral prefrontal cortex. This is a little counterintuitive, right? Because it actually suggests that default mode network is becoming less coherent and is integrating a bit with what we typically think of as a cognitive control network uh, with typical uh, development. And then decreasing uh, in, with, uh, in connectivity with the salience and emotion network uh, is this uh, medial prefrontal um, uh, hub here, which is actually sort of interesting that most things are increasing in connectivity, but salience and emotion network is, is um, decreasing. And this is widely um, 
uh, generally consistent with some of the, the models of sort of opposing development of cognitive control network and salience and emotional network. One, one sort of comes online earlier in uh, the neurodevelopmental period and takes, uh, takes on dominance. Uh, and then as the cognitive control network becomes more, more coherent uh, and a little bit more, uh, so we say, experienced, uh, it actually um, takes on a little bit more dominance. So this is just an illustration of what uh, those um, dots look like in the healthy comparison subjects. Kitty broke them down into different um, age compartments. It's not a perfect breakdown uh, by development, but it was a way of sort of illustrating um, that, that the process is actually fairly linear. This is that um, middle funnel gyrus node that was in, in green uh, showing increased um, connectivity uh, with age. And you'll notice that it actually starts pretty close to, to no connectivity and moves up to, to a modest uh, level of connectivity. Uh, again, this is cross-sectional, so um, we can't infer uh, a whole lot with that other than the pattern is there. Um, so um, I'm trying to move, move your faces down here so I can see what I'm talking about. So then you might ask the question, well, how does this change if you have an internalizing disorder, whether it be anxiety disorder or mood disorder? And in a classic sort of neurodevelop model, you would sort of think, well, okay, maybe there's just a flattening uh, of this curve uh, or, or straight line, right? Well, of course, you know, complexity is the rule rather than the exception. And so what we find um, is actually that there are interactions um, of um, sort of neurodevelopment uh, with internalizing disorders. Again, cross-sectional data, uh, we can't infer uh, anything uh, beyond just the, the cross-sectional na nature of the data. But if you sort of look at the blue dots uh, and the blue line, so these are all the uh, internalizing disorder patients, the pattern you basically see is a flattening of the curve, which is a little bit encouraging. Um, um, or a completely nonlinear um, relationship between age uh, and the pattern of, of development in these regions. Importantly, if you look um, sort of in these cognitive control network um, regions, you actually see enhanced connectivity in uh, kids and adolescents with um, earlier onset illness and diminished um, connectivity as you move in, into, the, into the 20s. And one of the theories that um, folks have uh, for that is that there might be precocious um, sort of uh, uh, network uh, consolidation uh, such that you know, kids are, are prematurely um, aging uh, and, and, and then that actually has a cost of their, their de developing sort of the finalized pattern of the networks before neurodevelopment is actually finished. All right, so let's talk about rumination. Let me just check the time, make sure I'm on track, track here. Okay. So here are some uh, illustrations of thoughts that come uh, to mind uh, when folks uh, might be ruminating. Uh, one, one particular challenge of this uh, is that a lot of folks who ruminate don't actually know that they're ruminating. Uh, some folks who are ruminating think they're um, problem solving. Uh, some folks who are ruminating think they're daydreaming. Um, and as we found out in, in some more recent uh, adolescents who have um, SITBs, they may actually be dissociating a bit. Uh, and so the, the concept of rumination has a little bit of a different flavor in adolescent than, adolescence than it does in sort of chronic recurrent uh, depression. The bottom line though, is that the questions that people um, ask themselves are general, um, they're abstract, and they tend to be passive. And they tend to have sort of this why characteristic to them, right? Why can't I handle things better? Why did this happen to me? Why do I feel so bad? Um, and they have sort of this global evaluative component to them. So you'll notice if you're familiar with CBT that these are some, some, some sort of links to cognitive schemas that people might have about themselves uh, and about the world. 
And uh, Ed Watkins, who's a co-PI on R61 with me, um, describes it as a habit. Rumination is a, a mental habit uh, of sort of um, recapitulating um, certain unresolved goals in one's mind and then asking these abstract questions about it, um, abstract general questions about it, and then having a passive stance uh, towards, towards the problem. Uh, so this might um, be, be uh, familiar uh, to folks if you've seen this one before. Like I said, it's hard to find jokes on depression. It's actually fairly easy to find jokes on rumination. Um, so this is uh, sort of a brief summation of our, of our work on effect sizes. So on the, on the y-axis is the effect size uh, that you observe in first episode. Uh, remitted MDD. So this is so the, they've had an episode. Um, they've been well on average about two years. What are the things that we observe as being most um, pertinent to maybe risk for, for recurrence? So the brief is a self-report measure uh, of executive functioning. PGNG is a, um, a parametric go-no-go task uh, that I um, revised uh, from Hugh Garavan's original um, task that he developed on his uh, postdoc uh, to um, mirror the Luria um, stop, um, stop, go, um, sort of tap once, tap twice uh, task. Um, and so there's a behavioral marker here uh, with a moderate effect size a activation marker in the left inferior part of lobule, lobule during errors of commission, that's a moderate. But look at the rumination uh, response scale. Um, actually, I had to change the scale to fit it on there. It's a, it's a tremendous uh, marker of, um, of depression, uh, effect size of three, which basically means that it's three standard deviations away from the mean of healthy comparison uh, participants. And then uh, rumination induction task, um, some activation in the default mode network and activation in the uh, salience and emotion network, plus somatosensory and uh, visual cortices, uh, which we'll talk about in just a moment, uh, also being large effect sizes. So executive functioning is on the left in blue, and that's kind of what we know already as being sort of relevant as a risk factor for um, illness and recurrence of illness. But look how rumination stacks up against it. Um, it's actually a pretty, pretty powerful marker in its own right. Okay. So this is just an illustration of, of the task itself. It's a, a derivation of the classic Nolan Hoxima um, uh, rumination induction. Uh, and the particular um, probes uh, that we use is a time of failure, a sad family event, some hurtful experience that you've had and some frustrating um, goal that you might want to have. And then you actually give them um, thoughts that sort of kick that rumination train into gear uh, for a bit of time. And then there's a control condition where they think about sort of things and try to visualize them as, as richly and deeply as they can. Uh, so this is a pilot study that Katie Burkhouse did uh, with us uh, a bit ago. Uh, the red boxes sort of illustrate salience and emotion and visual and somatomotor areas, and the yellow uh, areas indicate, um, sorry, I got that wrong. The yellow is posterior default mode, uh, limbic and visual areas, and then the salience, emotion, visual, and somatomotor um, are in red. This is a factor analysis of the extracted signal from, from these regions. The important thing to note is that all of these regions were engaged to a greater extent in adolescents with remitted depression. So these are adolescents with, you know, on average, I think their CDRS scores were, you know, in the mid thirties. So pretty much remitted. Uh, and they still show a very, um, a very um, notable um, visual signature, which suggests that they're actually re-experiencing the process uh, in a very vivid way. Uh, and then this is just a scatter plot of some of those um, factors uh, with symptoms and with uh, rumination. Even in a remitted sample, rumination and symptoms are, are pretty highly correlated. And then coming back to this concept of, of uh, resting state connectivity, uh, this just capitalizes on um, signal uh, in the fMRI signal that actually moves in um, a coherent pattern one with the other. 
So the, the PCC and the um, MPF are the yellow and orange lines here that sort of move in concert with each other and make up the um, default mode network. Uh, and then the cyan line is actually um, something from the inferior parietal sulcus, which is more typically thought of as cognitive control network. And you can see that it may even be anti-correlated. That's a little bit um, controversial and beyond our talk today because some of the ways that you pre-process the data can um, distort what might be interpreted as an anti-correlation. So this is just a little bit of data looking at seed connectivity uh, of the subdenial anterior cingulate as it relates to um, history of mood disorder uh, and how it relates to rumination. So this is just the left uh, subgenital anterior cingulate seed. And as um, those of you who know this well might, might uh, observe, there's some autocorrelation around the seed, uh, but you also get sort of um, the, the more medial component of the uh, salience and emotional network, or you might think of it as the, um, the more ventral aspect of the default mode network. These are all regions that have significantly elevated connectivity to that subgenual anterior cingulate in the remitted depressed group. And you'll notice that those are, these are actually regions that are um, more often in the um, cognitive control network. So you could interpret that potentially um, that there's sort of this in, intermingling of these, of these networks and that the cognitive control network may be sort of trying to um, recurrently slash repetitively sort of tamp down uh, some of the some of the signal that comes from the subgenital sub anterior cingulate. You don't do that type of analysis um, explicitly. Uh, in this in a, in a slightly different sample, this is with um, young adults uh, again with a history of depression. Uh, we used a three seed model of the cognitive control network. Uh, so the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the inferior parietal lobule, dorsal anterior cingulate. Um, and you can actually see that if you look at the um, connectivity of these hubs to the entire uh, geographic network from the, the EO uh, map, you'll see a diminished connectivity uh, in the remitted depressed folks. Again, uh, these are folks who have uh, Hamiltons that are on average about 2.5. They've been well on average about two years. You still have, see a very robust signature um, for case control analysis. Um, this is just a little bit of an illustration of, of that it's um, generally more on the right side than on the left. Um, and these are some of the um, uh, areas of um, lowest connectivity to the entire network um, in, in the model. And then um, that rumination uh, is inversely correlated with that connectivity level. So as that signal, um, the sort of coherence and coordination of those regions in the cognitive control network goes down, rumination goes up. Uh, and then uh, related as um, the, the proportion of connectivity from that network to the right inferior parietal lobule goes up, uh, ability to successfully stop an inhibitory um, uh, inhibitory uh, lure, lure response uh, goes up. So there's a inverse relationship between this network and rumination uh, and uh, inhib inhibitory control uh, capability. Uh, wanna, actually, I'll probably just skip over this in the interest of time because I wanna leave time for questions. I get, I get chatty. Um, so this is a little bit of Utah's uh, beauty uh, from the first fall that I was here. It's uh, easy on the eyes. All right, so let's talk a little bit about rumination-focused CBT. Uh, as I mentioned before, Ed Watkins uh, developed this therapy. Uh, for those of you who don't know the background, um, Ed Watkins was a student of Teasdale, and Teasdale was one of the founders of mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy. So Teasdale was sort of one of the many leaders in the third wave, uh, and Ed, uh, in his work using mindfulness-based um, CBT, found that there was a subset of, of folks with recurrent depression that were not responding to CBT or mindfulness-based CBT or medication. And what characterized them was sort of this pervasive ruminative pattern. And so he's worked uh, really hard to develop this therapy model. 
And it's really kind of a combination of, um, we were talking about this before, it's a combination of a cognitive processing therapy, a cognitive behavioral therapy, um, uh, ACT-based therapy, and MBCT, but it helps us focus very specifically on what are the rumination triggers, what are the consequences of rumination, and can we develop more uh, adaptive habits? Um, and that's one of the really nice things about his model is in traditional CBT, we sort of talk about, uh, we identify these cognitive distortions, right? These negative automatic thoughts. And we work um, at behavioral experiments and cognitive challenges to try and modify those. In Ed's model, we actually don't try and modify those thoughts at all. We just say, well, that's a thought. Um, it could be correct. It could be incorrect. We really don't care. What is the functional outcome of going with that thought? Does going with that thought lead to more rumination? Does it lead to more misery? Does it lead to a closing off of opportunities uh, in your life and in your choices? And if so, maybe it's not such a great habit. Maybe we should try and think about a different habit. So this is the original pilot study. Uh, this is Rachel Jacobs' work. Um, and she literally did almost all of this work uh, herself. Uh, I refer to this study as my um, road to Damascus uh, moment. When she first approached me in, oh, would have been 2013 or 2014, and she said, I want to show that this therapy changes the default mode network. <laughs> I said, whoa, slow down. Um, first of all, I don't think resting state fMRI is going to go anywhere because I'm a task fMRI guy. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and second of all, how could it be that specific? I wouldn't be talking to you today um, if she was wrong. So obviously uh, she was right. Um, so let me show you a little bit of that data and how it relates to, to Ed's prior data. So Ed's prior data was actually in adults uh, with active MDD. He had rumination-focused CBT in comparison to relaxation therapy, showing that both show large effect size reductions uh, in depression, uh, but that only RF CBT uh, results in a large effect size uh, change in uh, rumination. Relaxation therapy still um, reduces, and treatment as usual still reduces um, rumination a bit because of the autocorrelation. In, in Rachel's pilot sample, you can see the same pattern for rumination, but because it was with remitted MDD, you don't see the reduction uh, in depression. And in fact, you see that the treatment as usual kids tend to get worse, um, even though they were getting state-of-the-art treatment in our um, family depression clinic. All right, so uh, what is my, uh, what is my come, come to Jesus, road to Damascus, uh, Saul to Paul moment. Uh, this is pretty much it. So this is the, the, main, um, the main graph uh, that I wanna share with you today. So this is um, connectivity from the posterior cingulate, um, whole brain analysis comparing assessment only and rumination focused CBT. And you can see that there's a prominent reduction in connectivity from the posterior cingulate to both the right inferior frontal gyrus and bilateral inferior temporal gyrus uh, in uh, kids that get the treatment and no change in the kids that don't get the treatment. I've come to have more nuanced thoughts about this um, as we've moved into the RCT, but this is still um, our primary um, brain endpoint for the R61. The other thing to note is that um, depression symptoms um, changed uh, with treatment and stayed low uh, for two years in the RFCBT group relative to the assessment only group. Um, this is the CDRS, this is the self-report depression. Both of those are significant, although the CDRS obviously looks a little bit more um, compelling. The rumination uh, scale actually does some funky things. Uh, so the assessment only group um, drops uh, down near to where the um, kids with the treatment were after the treatment but then it pops back up. And we think that might be just a function of them, you know, filling out this darn survey so many times and figuring out that, yeah, this must be relevant, uh, but it's not a sustained uh, change in habit. 
The other thing to note uh, is that there's a significant difference as we follow these kids out. This is the pilot data, data still um, of assessment only uh, relative to RFCPT. Um, so there's um, a, a lot of kids um, who, who get some sort of mood disorder, um, even with RFCBT, if you go out um, a little bit over two years, but the RFCBT is significantly protective. And if you're looking specifically at a, um, a recurrence of depression, it's about a threefold uh, reduction in recurrence of depression in our little sample. Uh, and the reason why I bring this up is because um, at this point in time, I don't think our treatments are actually going to make depression go away, but I think they can reduce the number of symptoms and the, the longevity or the impact of the symptoms. And so that's really kind of our goal is to, to have milder and shorter uh, depressive episodes. Uh, you know, obviously it'd be nice not to have any, but I don't know if that's truly uh, a realistic thing. Also notable uh, that we had five hospitalizations uh, in the ensuing 120 months in the kids in the assessment only group. Mind you, these are kids that are getting family-based um, rainbow treatments or really good treatment um, and none in our RFCBT group. Granted, small sample, so we're not gonna go too far with it. Um, this is just a way of, of illustrating that um, these events tend to happen um, right after the treatment or pretty far out. All right, so what do we, what do we think? What do we know? Uh, we think that RFCBT, RFCBT protects against returning depressive symptoms. Pretty confident about that. Uh, that it protects against recurrence. Um, most of that data is in adults and it's in ads of work, but we do have a pilot uh, sample showing that it actually probably does the same thing in adolescents. Um, pretty confident that it reduces habitual rumination. Uh, and if for those of you who aren't familiar with the scale, it asks questions about sort of getting stuck in your head and pondering things and um, sort of brooding about things and how frequently they occur. Um, and so people will still ruminate, but they'll catch themselves and they'll replace that with a different sort of habit. The final thing that I wanna point out here before I show you the, the current model is that we started with this idea that um, RFCBT corrects brain abnormalities, right? It moves the brain back to a neurotypical pattern. Pretty convinced, uh, even though I showed you data, I'm pretty convinced that that's wrong. And let me try and uh, illustrate why. If somebody has an illness and they're currently well, they're in remission from the illness, it's not necessarily the case that they're actually back to sort of a neurotypical pattern of brain organization. They may actually be compensating uh, to stay well. They may actually be working really hard uh, to stay healthy. And so that's our alternative hypothesis is that this pattern that we observe is atypical uh, and it's intended to uh, stay, uh, to keep the person well, uh, and that our treatment actually reduces the need uh, for that compensatory process. Obviously, we don't have the data yet to, to distinguish between those two hypotheses, but it comes back to this earlier point that, that I was trying to make is that um, the goal may not ever be to do, um, to move back to neurotypical development. The goal may be to move to accommodative or remediate, remediated um, pattern of functioning. All right, so this is the basic um, premise of the model. This is actually the model uh, for the R33. So we have a, a relaxation therapy comparison uh, to rumination focused CBT. It works really nice because um, we teach relaxation therapy in RFCBT. So both treatments get an active coping uh, style with physiological modification. So, and we know that both of those treatments are effective in reducing symptoms. But rumination-focused CBT also gives folks active cognitive habits to replace the ruminative habit, including uh, constructive problem solving or, or even um, time, uh, time specific uh, distraction or leaving it be. Uh, and we think that inevitably there's gonna be a loss, a stress or a trauma, which is a trigger for another episode in adolescent depression. And if we haven't changed the rumin rumination habit, then the chances for depression relapse are incredibly high. However, 
if we have replaced the rumination habit and taught them some other habits that are a little bit more uh, functionally adaptive, then they may have no episode or they may have a minor episode. So this is just a schematic of the, of the study itself. Uh, we have um, depression and rumination symptoms uh, at baseline. We have neuropsych tests. Uh, we have fMRI. Uh, we're looking at engagement, functioning, and tolerability. We have a mid-treatment measurement, and then we have a post-treatment measurement. Uh, in the process of getting the grant um, resubmitted after revision, uh, we had to take out the relaxation therapy comparison for the R61, um, which in some ways is good because then we just focus on making sure we're um, delivering the RFCBT with good fidelity. But it also means that we're having a little bit of trouble now in, in putting our protocol paper together because the power was actually designed in lumping um, the, the, the R61 and R33 together. This is just a schematic of the same exact thing in a little bit easier bubble format to look at. Uh, it's actually gotten incredibly more complex uh, with COVID, of course, lots of lots of Zoom meetings uh, in there. And, and then we're doing a, tele, a teletherapy. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've actually modified the RFCBT such that the therapist has the option of discontinuing um, after 10 sessions or discontinuing up to four sessions later. Uh, sometimes we have kids with more complicated presentations and we're more interested in giving a good dose than a fixed dose. So this is just the samples, uh, age 14 to 17. Uh, and then the randomized have to be remitted. Uh, the R61 is a little bit smaller than the R33. Um, this is just a, a little bit of a nod to other treatments that are out there in the literature. You see lots of those mindfulness-based ones. And what I wanna do, um, four minutes, okay. I'm on my game today, which is surprising considering that uh, sleep deprivation is the, is the norm here. Uh, so we're looking at a couple of other things uh, that, that we're uh, interested in doing. Um, so doing rumination-focused CBT uh, with, with pregnant moms. And here's, here the idea is actually to change the mom's coping strategies so that the, um, the milieu for the uh, fetus and the infant is substantially improved such that we actually um, Im improve the lives of at least the mom and the infant uh, through the postpartum period. And, and my colleagues, Sheila Kroll and, and uh, Liz Conrad have been doing work with pregnant uh, moms and, and infants for a while. We're just going to try and add the RFCBT in there and see if we can um, change tra trajectories uh, for, the, for these women and their kids. Um, I mentioned um, to some of you before that we'll be doing RFCBT in kids with suicidal ideation and behaviors. This is um, uh, Mindy Westland Schreiner, who uh, hails from uh, Wisconsin and then Minnesota uh, with, with, uh, with a number of you folks. Uh, this will be part of the foundation for her K award. Um, uh, and then an at-risk study with positive family history uh, in adults. A similar study in um, uh, tweens and teens. This is Katie Bessett's um, NRSA slash dissertation. Uh, I don't have time to talk about it today, but one of the things I'm really super excited about is uh, in Utah, we have a text app that all students uh, in public schools and many kids in private and charter schools have access to. It's crisis. Um, it's a crisis text line. Uh, for suicide, and we're, um, we've been uh, charged uh, to figure out how well it's working and how to improve it and for whom and, and when and what and why um, by the Utah State Board of Education, so we're working on that. Uh, and that, um, I'll skip over the last one just in the interest of time, and that is me uh, with two minutes to spare. Uh, thank you so much uh, for listening to me ramble. Uh, I hope that was a nice diversion uh, for you, uh, which is one of the things we teach in RFCBT uh, is time-specific diversion. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Scott. That was fantastic. I really appreciate that. Uh, excellent talk and uh, really very thought-provoking uh, review of a lot of different work. And uh, thank you. Uh, so I think people uh, who have questions can please submit them in the uh, Q&A box at the bottom of Zoom. I see that we already have one. 
Uh, that's from Amanda Schlesinger. I think I'll, I'll read these aloud and then Scott can answer them. Uh, were there any differences in the impact of RFCVT by gender or by trauma history or adverse experiences? That's a great question. Uh, so those of you who do um, adolescent work may know, um, well, first of all, so um, University of Illinois Chicago is an inner city school. So most, most of our kids actually have um, exposure to trauma. The, uh, the modal level uh, for inner city kids and exposure to trauma in Chicago is 85%. Um, so it's the rule rather than the exception. Uh, so that's a little bit tricky um, to model. Uh, in the R61 slash R33 that we're doing now uh, in Utah, we don't have quite the uh, incidence of trauma uh, in Utah uh, that, we, that we did in Chicago, but it's still remarkably high, uh, which, is, which is upsetting. Uh, so we're gonna, we actually have an a exploratory aim uh, thinking that um, RFCBT is actually probably really effective uh, for um, moderate level traumas. So if you think about um, a neurodevelopment in a sort of neglect or abusive uh, environment, kids may actually learn um, that being passive um, and sort of you know being being a little bit more withdrawn is is protective. So the perpetrators actually won't. Um, uh, won't, won't attack them um, if, that's, if that's the case. But if the trauma is too severe, they're probably not going to be able to engage in the therapy in a really meaningful way. Uh, so we think that there's actually a sweet spot for what RFCBD can do for kids who've actually experienced trauma and have learned that being passive is actually an effective coping strategy. We actually want them to learn as they move into adulthood that being active in your coping, um, even if that's being mentally active is an important part of, of maintaining health. In terms of sex differences, there are sex differences and, and they're sort of very um, very much expected uh, with neurodevelopment because boys are a little bit slower to develop their sort of self-awareness and concept of self and theory of mind uh, than girls. I'd say about 80% of, of teen girls um, get this right away. Um, they, they get it. They understand it. They're like, this is awesome. It's really helpful. It's about half and half with boys. Um, I've had some who like, literally I'm introducing this idea that they have thoughts and they might actually be able to, to, um, understand and maybe even modify their thoughts is like, it's mind blowing. Um, I had one, one, uh, 17 year old boy who said, that's dope. Uh, there are some who are like, I don't get it. And, and I, as a therapist, are like, so you just spend an hour ruminating about something that happened at work and you got angry at people about it and you had a miserable day, but you're still not connecting the dots. Um, so if they're not able to get some sense of theory of mind about what rumination is as a mental, internal mental process, the therapy is really hard. And so sometimes you have to go more towards the behavioral experimentation uh, route with those, uh, with those boys before you can get into understanding the ruminative habit. Thank you. Uh, so we've got a question uh, from Lydia Zalowska. Could you please discuss uh, more similarities and differences between RFCBT and mindfulness-based interventions such as MBCBT, MBCT? Uh, what are the pros and cons of, I, of either of the both of those in your opinion? Yeah. So one of the one of the the kernels of of MBCT is understanding um, that thoughts don't have to own our experience, right? They can just be. Uh, and in RFCBT, we take that and we take it one step further, which is that's a thought, we can just let it be, but we can also evaluate the function of that thought and what are the, the consequences of having that thought and then maybe even replacing it with a different thought or a different action. So it's a little bit like one step beyond what MBCT does, at least in my, uh, my understanding of it. Uh, I've had a, a couple of really fun conversations with David Fresco about um, how they may not be as different as I think they are. So take that with a grain of salt. A grain of salt. 
question from uh, Zainab uh, Baskozi. Uh, do you ever, did you ever check for or planning to check if there are any changes in the attention networks after rumination based CBT in addition to the default mode networks and the uh, salience and motion networks? Uh, we have not. Uh, as I alluded to before, uh, Rachel was very focused on uh, the default mode network. Um, I think we're we're going to do that because of the way the RCT is designed. Uh, we're not going to be looking at the connectivity data until the the data is um, finished being collected. So that'll be something that you know comes actually quite a bit down the road. Uh, great suggestion. Lots of questions. Uh, well, this one from Helen Bounstein Ma. Thank you for a great talk. Could you describe how rumination focused CBT techniques uh, di differ from uh, diffusion exercises in ACT and what are the unique elements of this treatment? Uh, so similar. Yeah, so that's gonna be a place that's beyond my skill set. <laughs> um, so the diffusion or decentering, um, depending upon the model that, that you use, um, isn't really something that comes into this model to my, to my knowledge. Got a question from uh, Jasmine Kamchong. I've seen very similar trends in altered resting state network in addiction, including evidence of compensatory mechanisms in those that are in recovery. Have you been able to examine substance use comorbidities in your participants? Uh, yes. So this is one of the things, um, you know, I, I, I sort of have this, um, list of things that I've done wrong for the entirety of, entirety of my career, and this falls on that list. So the, the modal patient uh, with depression has comorbidity, uh, and that comorbidity may include um, substance use. And when we do, uh, when we write our grants uh, for NIMH reviewers, those are things that we typically exclude. Um, so there is some low level substance use in our sample um, of, of young adults, but it's really, really low level stuff. And it's probably not enough, um, not enough variance to actually tell you anything meaningful about um, substance use, unfortunately. Because you're generally excluding those patients with kind of more severe. We're, so. we're excluding those patients, but um, sort of coming back maybe to a broader point, um, executive dysfunction um, in adolescent psychiatric illnesses is the rule rather than the exception. So it's not terribly specific, um, but it is actually fairly sensitive. So thinking about um, psychosis or substance use or mood disorders, you tend to see variations on a theme with executive dysfunction in those. Anxiety disorders tends not to show that, um, which, which may just be part of the difference between um, anxiety disorders and mood disorders is, is this sort of third variable. Um, Got a question from uh, Michael Bronstein. Have you seen any evidence that uh, rumination focused CBT influences constructs that are related to both rumination and suicidal ideation? Uh, for example, perceived defeat, uh, entrapment, or high, highly certain predictions that negative future events will occur above and beyond the impact on depression? Uh, fa fascinating question. And that's actually the, the project that Mindy's working on right now, because there are, there are some clear um, links and parallels between um, SITBs um, and thoughts around them uh, and rumination more broadly. The thing that we've observed um, is that probably is true for maybe mild and moderate suicidal ideation, but as it moves into moderate and severe suicidal ideation and also the inclusion of self-harm acts, there's a fairly high base rate of sort of, um, I'm gonna use the word dissociation um, as sort of a, a coping mechanism for how the, how the youth integrates their, their sort of concept of who they are and, and how they engage in these self-harm behaviors. Um, at least in the in the youth that we see in, in in Salt Lake, so I'm not entirely sure that it's going to work well when dissociation is is a process because we really want people to see the ruminative thoughts 
and then the 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 sort of um, behavioral or mental release procedures that come with SITBs as being sort of a consequence of that, and then replacing that habit with something else. And if they don't see that link, if they're dissociating and, and they don't understand that link, then we're probably not gonna be able uh, to help them a ton. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the only answer I've got so far. <laughs> Great, so I'm gonna jump down to a question from uh, Sasha Zagalov, because I saw that she had mentioned something earlier. Uh, in the clinic, we are trying to move towards more time limited care. One thing that will come up is that some patients may still have symptoms after three to four or five to six months. I'm thinking that an explicit focus on rumination as a target may be an effective way to say at the outset, we are going to teach skills to target processes. You may still have some symptoms when we're done, but you'll know how to cope with them. What do you think about that as a proposal? Yeah, that's a that's a great thought. Uh, I can tell you that we have some kids who have pretty significant trauma, and we sort of you know say at the outset that we're not going to be doing any trauma processing therapy or anything like that. And even at the end of the RFCBT modules, we still recommend that they do some some trauma work. Um, and you're absolutely right. Our our goal is sort of a skill based. Um, identification and replacement type of model. Um, and it's meant to be a very active and specific thing or set of things uh, that the adolescent can do rather than ruminate. So, you know, catching themselves in the process of rumination, having this sort of chuckle aha moment, I'm ruminating. And then is this really the best way to spend my time? Um, are there other things I can do to get out of the rumination? Um, and that includes things that are actually low, low effort um, skills. So, you know, like taking a break, doing something for distraction. Both of those, if time limited, can be very effective for managing rumination. Um, so, so you're absolutely right. It can be a modular component to a sequence of treatments. Got a question here from Hannah Berg. Uh, thank you for this interesting talk. Can you speak a bit more? on the difference between uh, correcting resting state brain abnormalities and introducing a compensatory strategy for rumination. If, if the treatment target is rumination, it seems that the result of successful treatment should be a change in resting state brain activity because resting state is the context in which patients would employ their new tactic. Can you comment more on what kind of finding would speak to one hypothesis or the other again? Uh, correcting resting yeah. state brain and yeah. Strategies. So, so this is um, this is the basis for a grant. I think I've written now in eight different <laughs> eight different variations. And the basic premise is that it's really critically important to understand resting state networks, um, both in the active state and in the remitted state, so you can actually catalog what is symptom based independent of what is rumination based. And so then you can actually dissect what are the what are the resting state network characteristics of high rumination independent of symptoms. So that's actually really critically important. And then how do you modify that in a very specific way? So that's part of the reason why we're, one of the many reasons why we're working with remitted um, adolescents is that it leads to a cleaner model, but I still need to know what rumination looks like with symptom load. And I can't get um, reviewers to, 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 to write checks for that or to get excited about writing checks for that because it's really complicated. So we've got one from uh, Christina Registad. Are there specific trainings or certifications available that you would recommend to get trained in RFCBT? Uh, that's a great question. So there are not uh, at present uh, the manual is in book form and, and you, can, you can buy it. I can tell you from having worked um, closely with this model uh, for the better part of 16 months with probably four separate multi-day training sessions with Ed. Um, granted, I told you before that I'm not, I'm not a fluent CBT therapist because it's been so long since I've done it. But I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 100 hours that I put in 
to the point where I feel like I can understand, explain and execute the model reasonably well. Um, it's a pretty advanced therapy um, in particular because um, it's very antithetical to sort of the classic formulations of CBT where the therapist um, inserts themselves early in the process to modulate um, behaviors and thoughts. Here, we spend a lot of time doing the cognitive processing to try and understand it before we do anything. And so it starts out as a very rich insight-based um, processing therapy, and then it moves to um, behavioral and cognitive experimentation with different um, habit strategies. Uh, and, and it's really, um, it's very different um, than CBT that way, because you have to be you have to be right on pace uh, with where the, the patient is at all times, because it's so easy to pull them out of sort of their ruminative loop into the room or the Zoom space with you, and then you kind of lose the flow. Uh, in getting the R61, the program officer um, asked us explicitly if we were prepared um, should we be successful to do a multi-site um, RCT and to provide training. Uh, and so we are in the process of codifying the manual, integrating the, the um, training uh, rating, rating system. But I would say that it's probably not a, it's probably not a weekend workshop sort of thing. It's probably a, a, you know, a multi-session, um, probably multi-Zoom session training module with practice cases. Thanks for the forward to that. That's great. Uh, was there any impact? This is from uh, Afshan Amjam. Uh, was there any impact on uh, SI or SIB with rumination focused CBT? Uh, that we don't know yet. Uh, it was such a small uh, pilot sample because now we're actually, um, we have the one R61 funded uh, arm of the study, which is with. Uh, kids with remitted mood disorder without recent SI or SITBs, um, and then a second arm, which we're self-funding just for pilot data, which is um, the same exact treatment, but with kids with active depression. Um, and then we have two other arms, which are the, I alluded to before, the basis for some of uh, Mindy's um, K, K pilot data, which is a community, um, sample of kids uh, with SITBs. Um, they can be um, active or remitted. Uh, they can have uh, an illness besides mood disorder. They just have to have recent, um, and I mean within the last week uh, to two weeks, SITBs that are the explicit focus of the treatment. Um, and so we have one, one arm of that study is for community dwelling uh, adolescents. And then the second arm is a warm handoff um, a warm handoff study where we actually greet the people during their discharge meeting on the inpatient unit and they're on the inpatient unit for SITBs. So I don't know the answer to that yet, but I'm excited about finding out what it might be. We've got one from Bonnie Kleinstugan. Uh, thanks so much for the terrific talk. I wonder if you have any evidence from your work on brain mechanisms uh, for personalization with regard to prediction treatment or prediction uh, for remission. And I know this is an interest of yours, pre predicting treatment. Yes, I, um, I, didn't, I didn't talk about this work um, at all. So I've been um, hyper-focused, uh, maybe even obsessive about the cognitive control network as a uh, moderator of um, treatment response. Um, this includes um, behavioral performance. This includes uh, task-related activation. And this includes resting state connectivity of the cognitive control network. Um, and it, it kind of goes back, I mean, this is um, trivializing it, but it goes back to some of the early psychotherapy work that suggested that um, those of you who have heard this um, acronym probably brings you way back, but YAVIS, which is... Um, I think young, affluent, verbal, intelligent, and social, if I get all the acronym uh, letters right, those are also um, markers of people who probably have um, pretty good executive functioning. Uh, and so some, some folks um, need a little bit less guidance um, for treatment than others. Uh, of those things, uh, and again, this is you know, me, me acknowledging 
uh, the humility that science often places us uh, into the position of, the best markers um, are our resting state markers. Uh, and there's a couple of good reasons for that. One um, is because it's unconstrained. So I spent the bulk of my career getting excited about having a constrained task paradigm to challenge people. The reality is even if you create a, a constrained task paradigm to sort of harness what people are doing and when they're doing it and how well they're doing it, they're still gonna have other thoughts. Uh, and they're still going to have other things going on in the back of their brain. And so there's a lot more noise that translates into um, resting state fMRI markers being much more reliable than task based fMRI markers. And obviously, if it's not reliable, it can't be a great predictor. So long winded answer. Great question. There's a question here from we got one from Charles Lewis. Uh, thank you for an excellent talk. That seems to be a theme. Uh, could you comment on how you conceptualize the relationship between rumination, cognitive inflexibility, and suicide risk? Yeah, fab fabulous question. Uh, there's a, um, this sort of, you know, comes a little bit back to Tom Joyner's model about um, hopefulness and, and, and belongingness. There's a, um, uh, a shrinking of the of the light at the end of the tunnel that happens um, in this process of um, intense suicidal ideation, um, cognitive inflexibility, uh, and and rumination, and they kind of all come together in this pattern of things are crappy, they're always going to be crappy, um, and I can't figure out a way out of it. Um, and so that those things all kind of do fit together uh, very nicely. We actually have a, a pilot study that we're trying to do um, with kids who have recent um, recent admission for suicidal ideation that's right along those lines. And in fact, um, we're toying with the idea of actually doing neuromodulation to modify cognitive flexibility so that you can then learn new habits um, to address the rumination. Uh, and if you can do both of those things, then you're probably gonna at least get a, a crack at reducing some of the suicidal ideation. I say that with some hesitation though, because um, as, as you probably all know, for some people, it's not um, the current episode um, that is the trigger for SI. It's actually the fear of another episode in the future now that they're starting to feel better. They're sort of like, I've come out of the tunnel, I'm feeling a ton better, but the thought of having another episode in the future is so overwhelming for me that it's a trigger for the suicidal um, ideation or even behavior. So I think we have hopefully a little bit more time. Um, got a couple more questions. How, uh, this one from uh, Sabine Schmidt. How is the severity of rumination distributed across subgroups of depression? For example, is it found more often in more severe depression or anxious depression, or less found in depression heavy in vegetative symptoms? Uh, and, and that's I, a great. Another question that was sort of that follows on that, which is, you know, I'm thinking of um, Leanne Williams' work in adults with depression, where she sort of has hypothesized almost, you know five neural, if I remember correctly, five neural subtypes of depression, um, one which she characterizes as, you know, um, very uh, presenting with a lot of ruminate, ruminations, another with, uh, uh, you know, hyperattention to negative valence information environment and so forth. I just w wondered if you could comment, expand on, on, on Sabine's question. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's a great, um, a great, uh, a great comment. So um, Yuta Yorman um, has posed sort of a three subtype model uh, of depression, sort of a anxious, worry, ruminative uh, type, an anhedonic type, and an impulsive, um, disexecutive type. Um, and then uh, I think Leanne sort of um, simultaneously came up with sort of this five uh, subgroup model. I tend to think of it, um, I tend to think of it as being rooted uh, in, in anxiety, but that's only because um, that's only because of who we study, right? So we tend 
Um, and, and this is just you know, the, way, the way things work in science. We tend to recruit people into studies who are currently well. So um, people with more anhedonic or vegetative depression are less likely to come into full remission. And so they're probably not gonna come into our study. Um, moreover, uh, we and some other folks have suggested that when people come out of a depressive uh, episode, sort of the anhedonic features and the vegetative symptoms go away, but the anxiety and rumination is still there. So I think we're really focused more on that sort of um, anxiety, ruminative, um, negative schema uh, subtype. And to get to your um, question, Sophia, the, the, the framework for that is sort of really uh, an extension of uh, Ed, Ed Watkins would um, frown at me for saying this, but it's sort of really an extension of sort of these negative self um, self thoughts. So if you look at like negative automatic thoughts or self attributional style or um, locus of control, these are all sort of interwoven with rumination as sort of a construct mm -hmm. and neuroticism too. Got a question from Katie Cullen. Uh, oh, wait, one, 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 one more thing. Um, I was going to mention that 87% of uh, folks that um, we run across in our studies have elevated rumination. So we can think of it as sort of a, a, of a subtype, um, but it may be a subtype plus other things, right? There might be a cognitive inflexibility rumination subtype and a rumination sort of more negative schema um, subtype. It's pretty pervasive. Perhaps a dimension, uh, and then there are, you're somewhere in that rumination dimension. Yeah. Uh, so a question from Katie Cullen, can uh, rumination focus CBT help adolescents engage in positive or productive daydreaming or mind wandering and uh, are you able to measure that? Are <laughs> that's a that's a great question. Uh, the um, graduate student working with me, um, Katie Bassett, um, <laughs> suggested that we add some of these um, some of these elements in into our, our measurements. Um, the only thing I'd say about that is um, when I do um, when I do the the treatment, the therapy. One of the modules that I do is actually essentially the equivalent of a positive mood induction, which is that sort of not necessarily mind wandering, but more of, um, I refer to it as the treasure chest, which is we sort of go through the cognitive processing of, of really intense positive memories that they have, and we make them vivid and real and more accessible. So if they're having uh, a bad day uh, and they're starting to ruminate, one of the options is actually to go to that treasure chest and sort of do a deep in, immersion into that memory. Um, the kids who, who, who really dig that um, get super excited about it. There's some folks who get really worried about that. Like, well, if I, if I never really address my problems, uh, then, then I'm just sort of living in denial. And the whole point that we try and make is that we're just trying to get a break from the rumination to change the mental pattern so that you can be more um, emotionally and cognitively flexible. I don't think that's quite what you were uh, referring to, but it is one of the things that we have as a module in the treatment. Right. So I, I read it earlier. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say we should probably stop soon. Yeah, stop by 1230. Yes. Uh, I wanted to say I, um, I read an earlier question from Sasha Zagalov. I, I see that she's here in the chat. I don't know if she wanted to follow up on that at all, if there was any, or, or if the question was asked, if I was able to, to ask it for you. Can you can you say that again? I, I got oh. I got lost there. Oh, sorry, that was a that was me. Um, Sasha, did you get your question answered? Yes. Yes. So, okay. Sasha's gotten her question answered. So yeah, I think that was all the questions then. Uh, thank you, Scott, again, for really, um, you know, a, a great, excellent talk and, and then uh, handling a lot of uh, very interesting uh, and, and dynamic questions. This has been a great discussion. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a great discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all for asking so many questions. It's really nice. It's really nice to get that engagement, especially yeah. talking to a glass screen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and what you had to say was so clinically relevant. So it's great. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's super exciting. Um, 
I've, I've, I've uh, not been excited about a therapy model uh, as, as this one just yet. Mm-hmm. You and I are meeting, but if you, let's take a break. Um, okay. And we can just give, give ourselves a five minute break and I'll see you back on Zoom. Okay, sounds good. All right, bye. Bye. Thank you.